quick shout out to the sponsors. I'm going to start off with the context, then go to the taxonomy, and then actually home in on what do people really mean by synthetic data. And then I'm going to share some suggestions for what I think should happen and some predictions. So why are people so interested in synthetic data? Why is there so much urgency? If you follow the conversations in LinkedIn, you'll notice that this um, article by Mark Ritson um, just a few days ago has caused a lot of interest. Now, to be honest, almost every word in both the heading and the, the lead there is not quite correct. Synthetic data is not as good as real data. Um, it cannot deliver a 95% match to real survey results. Um, I think we saw a very interesting example from Andy earlier of when it does provide quite an interesting match. Um, but when a, a widely respected uh, figure like Mark Ritson talks about it, we realize that the industry has to look up and has to take notice, even if it doesn't agree and then it needs to think about why doesn't it agree, where doesn't it agree, and what precisely should we be doing? And synthetic is a tricksy kind of word. Um, it means different things to different people. So you can look up a definition of synthetic and it kind of spreads its meaning across the world of chemistry, where it's mostly a positive, um, the, word, the world of logic, where it means to combine different types of thinking synthetically, and also in things like um, synthetic people. So it has positives and negatives. I thought I'd have a look at a, th a thesaurus type view. And this is a great indication of why it's generating different ideas. Manufactured is very much a description of what synthetic data is. Fabricated is also a description, but it has a different tone to it. Words like fake, phony, false, and hokey are all associated with the synthetic, and they're all like really negative. I love this word, ersatz, the um, Oxford English Dictionary, used or made as an inferior substitute for something. That's probably quite accurate uh, of where we're looking at with synthetic data. But similarly, before we had synthetic insulin, it used to be extracted from the pancreas of pigs and cows. It was an inefficient process and it gave rise to all sorts of allergies and problems. So synthetic is a curious term. Um, here is an outline of the taxonomy that I'm going to be going through. So what type of data, the applications in market research, the benefits of synthetic data and the challenges and the considerations. So if we think about the types of data, it's being used to generate numerical data. So what might be the annual consumption? How much might you spend on something? It's being used to generate categorical data. So brand and product preferences, agree, disagree statements. It's being used to generate text data. And again, coming to the AI bots that Andy was demonstrating earlier in the webinar, that was generating open-ended comments um, and answers to questions from the users. We can see it generating images and we might well say, okay, for this type of persona, please show me the brands of drinks that they would have on their bar at home. One can very much think of it in the near future, generating consumer vox pop. So, bring that consumer to life, get them to talk to you about their experience. None of this means the synthetic data is good. None of this means the synthetic data is bad. This is simply a description of the types of data that we're talking about. Then we need to think about how synthetic data is generated. So the first way is rules-based. So you might try to model shopping behavior or travel behavior. So you set up some rules. So 50% of people who buy A also buy B. You apply that to a market simulator to see if that actually describes the outcomes. Algorithmic is used a lot. And, and there's a technique called SMOT, which is used to create synthetic people in order to compensate for undersampling some people. 
And very loosely what it does, it finds a random case, it finds a, a match for it, and then it averages them out to make a new case. So that's simply an algorithm. Um, machine learning can be used so you can look at historical customer satisfaction data and generate extra cases. So you might say, OK, we know that this is the pattern. So with that pattern, we should be able to generate some new cases within that. And then there is the one that is attracting most of the attention at the moment using the large language models. For example, creating personas from pre-trained large language models. And then there are hybrid approaches, and I'm seeing quite a few of these. So they use an algorithmic approach to generate numeric and categorical um, data. And then they use LLMs to generate the open-ended responses that match that categorical data. So this is the different sorts of ways that people are now generating. What are the applications in market research? Well, the oldest application is actually privacy preservation. For decades, census authorities and other holders of large amounts of information have added random noise to data sets before releasing them so that people's identity is preserved. Some of the advocates for synthetic data are arguing that if we mostly use synthetic data in the future, then we will improve the privacy provided to research participants. If we, Even if all we did was take real data and make synthetic lookalikes, we would probably end up protecting a lot of people's privacy. It's not a universal view, but it's one of the views we hear. Testing and validation. So test data can be generated to check that models and research instruments actually appear to work. So AI is often used to provide multiple answers to a survey before the survey is fielded to check that its logic flow is right, that it all seems to come together in the right way. It can also be used to generate test data to validate a theory or a model. So if you've got a travel or a consumption model, then that you've developed, you can generate some test data, make sure that it, the outcome matches the real world. Um, one of the examples from another industry is that when they wanted to look at the murmurations of starlings, these are flocks of hundreds and thousands of birds flying together, they created a model where each sterling um, was only looking at the bird to its left, right, and in front of it, and would mimic the behavior. And they were able then to show with that test data that this replicated the real world example of what happened. We're seeing it used for data augmentation. So missing responses, data imputation. That either because some people didn't answer your questions or maybe you chose not to ask all the questions to everybody. And so you add in responses that you didn't get. Um, dealing with degrees of freedom issues. So if any of you do um, conjoint modeling, discrete choice modeling, you'll know that you don't actually ask each person enough questions to build a valid model of that person's data. So the common response for the last probably 20 years has been to use hierarchical bays, which borrows information from other people in the data to create synthetic people who do represent the marketplace and have the right characteristics. It's used to rebalance data. Um, so you've done a study, maybe you've got too few young men and you want to increase the representation. Obviously, you could just reweight the data. And some people argue that reweighting the data creates synthetic data. Other people vehemently disagree with that. Um, but the use of synthetic data to compensate for undersampling is being used really widely at the moment, and it's rejected by some people. And this is very much a hot topic about data augmentation. At, mo at the moment, from my observations, almost everybody who's using synthetic data as a data augmentation technique is not basing it on generative AI. They're not basing it on LLMs. All of that quant stuff seems to be coming from conventional algorithms, conventional machine learning, um, Shapley values, regression, all of these sorts of things. 
but they are beginning to use large language models to put in some extra detail, particularly, as I mentioned, things like open-ended comments that might be attributed to that profile. When we're doing data augmentation, there's perhaps two cases that we need to think about separately, but they are tending to blur. So imagine you've done a study and you've got too few young men in the study. You can use data augmentation as a better form of weighting so that the total picture is better. And when you do the modeling, it behaves in a less lumpy way. And that is really looking at data augmentation as nothing more than a slightly better form of weighting. If it works, some people reject it and say weighting is a better solution, but that is the, the paradigm. The second is trying to understand the underrepresented group better. So in this case where we've got too few young men, can we get a better understanding of this um, data by using more advanced techniques? And this is very similar to what's being done at the moment in the UK around the general election. Lots of different companies are using multi-level regression and post-stratification to try to work out what will happen in each of the over 600 constituencies based on 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 interviews at the national level. So they don't have enough data at the constituency level. So they're using this uh, multi-level regression with post-stratification to try to achieve that. And this is this use of um, modern statistical techniques to try to analyze underreported groups, under researched groups. Then we get the one that is perhaps the most contentious and actually represents the AI bods that Signoy was showing earlier replacing primary data. So, creating personas that we can ask qualitative questions to, creating personas that can be asked quantitative questions. At present, these are mostly done via generative AI. This is the thing that has really taken off since um, the highly publicized launch of uh, ChatGPT. What, about 18 months ago, was it? No, about 20 months ago. So all of this change has happened in that time. And it's very much driven by this. This is a super hot topic. There are advocates. Um, you saw Andy speaking earlier. You can see the article online by Mark Ritson. There are passionate opponents to this. And then there are lots of interested skeptics. Um, and it's this use of primary data that is what is in Mark Ritson's article. I do recommend that you read the article. I do not recommend that you believe it too much. Um, what are the benefits of going down this synthetic data route? Cost and speed efficiency. So I've highlighted this if primary data capture can be replaced by data constructed by AI, it's going to be cheaper and it's going to be much faster. You can be in a meeting with your clients talking about the need to make changes and they think, well, would, do customers really value that? You could find it out then rather than having to book some research and get the result the following day. Potentially an enormous change in what's going on. Um, Mostly relates to using pre-trained LLMs to generate synthetic data without the need for traditional data collection. However, there are hybrids where you're using traditional data collection to enrich this process. And again, I think we saw that a little earlier today. Um, and this is why synthetic data is hot. It's all about speed and it's all about cost. Enhanced data. So... This is about data that's been collected in a conventional way and is then enhanced or augmented the way that we do with hierarchical bays, the way that some people are trying to do, for example, with the, the multi-level regression and post-stratification. These sorts of approaches to get more value out of data. Um, a key divide in people's opinion is whether it only you replicates the primary data. So if you use something like bootstrapping or data fusion, every piece of data you used came from a real person and has not been changed. It's not been created. Or are you using approach which creates new cases? Even if that is simply taking two people who are very similar and making a new person, a third one who is 
the average of those two or just by adding noise to the process. People talk about the another benefit of synthetic data being ethical and legal compliance. Um, it could be created to protect the anonymity of the research participants to ensure that diversity requirements are met. So we could insist that the correct ratio of male, female and other categories, the correct ethnic mixes were achieved by using synthetic data approaches um, if we felt that they worked. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will create anonymity or that it will create systems that are, that are diverse. But the people who are putting synthetic data forward, some of them are talking about these potential benefits. Better data. Could synthetic data match the real world better than survey data? For example, might we get more honest qualitative answers? Um, synthetic data would be willing to answer more questions. If we talk about purchase likelihood, we know that real interviews conducted with real people are rubbish. Um, we have to offset massively between what people say they will buy and what they would buy. Might synthetic data that was built to take that into account produce a more natural response, allowing more people to actually use the data. At the moment, it's really difficult if um, you allow a non-researcher to use a DIY survey platform, they might believe those declared intentions to purchase. We could make that a lot safer if synthetic data would cover it. At the present, there is no evidence I'm aware of that synthetic data is currently better. You hear people talk about it. It is actually mentioned in uh, Mark Ritson's article. Um, but I have not seen any evidence of synthetic data being better. I've seen some evidence of it being as good sometimes, but not better. Challenges and considerations. The big challenge is whether it works. That leads to another challenge. What do we mean by work? If it's giving us 80% the same answer, is that working? Maybe, maybe not. How do we test it? Um, and also, if it works now, will it work in the future? So all of these are things that we need to look at. But another challenge relates to the technical complexity. Synthetic data, is it so complex, so much a black box that buyers can't ever reliably assess what they're buying? Even more scary, is it so complex and black box that vendors can't assess what it really is? It's doing its own learning. We don't know how it's doing that learning. So can we ever be sure that we understand how it works? Another one is simply acceptance and trust. And one of the things I've noticed in a lot of the debates in LinkedIn, for example, is that some people equate synthetic with fake and they're not prepared to discuss the question of whether it works or not. I do believe they're entitled to their view. I don't agree with them. Um, some people appear to be offering technically flawed arguments in support or against synthetic data. So uh, an example of a flawed argument in favor. It worked when I did Z, so it will work in other cases. Flawed arguments against it. It did not work when I did X in a context of Y, so it won't work for A, B or C. Both of these are not helpful in going forward. Um, what do people mean? So I've given this, this taxonomy and it's really big and broad. But at NUMR, we've also done lots of research with people in the insights industry globally. And a few people, nerdy type people like me, embrace a really wide definition of almost anything where you're manipulating data. If it's not what people have told you, then there is a degree of it being synthetic. However, most people mean creating virtual participants for qual or quant, and they mean either solely from large language models or by combining previous studies with large language models. That really is the core of what people are talking about when they're talking about synthetic data. So my thoughts on this, 
I personally reject the argument that there's a moral argument against creating synthetic participants. I think it's entirely down to whether it delivers value to the user slash the buyer. We need much better testing, ideally with agreed protocols. I'm going to share a couple of thoughts on how we might do that. And we should build some theoretical underpinning for when and why synthetic data might work and when it might not. At the moment, everything is inductive. We, you know, we don't believe that the sun will come up tomorrow just because it came up the last several million days. We have an understanding of the solar system and we can see why it happens. We shouldn't do tests that just say the last five times we did it, it worked, so it will work again in the future. So here's an example of where I've actually seen it working. Thinking about the US auto market, create a set of personas that represent the views of the leading car brands and ask these personas to rate the key brands on style, comfort, price, etc. I've also seen people take that sort of approach um, to US car brands and ask them to ask the personas to answer conjoint questionnaires, looking at things like engine type price. And it comes up with really consistent. These are stable values. They're the sort of things that people talk about. There's lots of background data. Where do I think it won't work? OK, so I, I let's think about 200 national car service centers. This is where you take your car to be serviced perhaps once a year. These service centers currently collect 30 interviews per service center per month. This data is used to assess staff management and the center overall. It impacts the bonus payments for these employees. I struggle to see how data from a general pre trained large language model can help detect current changes in performance. Let's say Joe in the, the Nottingham branch of this car service center has suddenly got a lot worse at his customer handling and his performance and how clean he leaves the car. How on earth would the LLM pick up that this centre had changed and that it was Joe that had changed without substantial data from this service centre being fed in that was current? And I suspect that any employee who lost their bonus because a synthetic participant complained about their performance would really have a very strong case in court. So my suggestions always tell users what processing has been conducted. And I don't mean just tell them about the synthetic, all manipulation. If you have rebased the data, if you've excluded outliers, you ought to be telling the users of the data about that. And of course, synthetic data. Explain where rules, algorithms, generative AI are being used in that process. When testing synthetic data, include past studies. Can it replicate past studies? So you've got some old survey data. Can you generate the same survey responses using the synthetic? But also test whether it can replicate the real world, because at the end of the day, we don't want to replicate survey data or qualitative data. We want a better forecast of what's happening in the real world. How might you do that? Well, in the UK, for example, we know how many people have a driving license. We know how many people own a car. Um, we know various other, well, how many people got a passport. If you include questions like that, then you could have a look to see whether the survey data or the synthetic data was closer to the real data in the world. Um, example for augmented. This is one of the ones that I've done in the already. Take a past study, randomly remove some data. So I removed 50% of the young men. Generate the new data and then compare it with the total before the data was removed. Compare it with the total if you had used weighting, which is what you would normally have done to compensate for this. And if possible, compare it with the real world. Synthetic data from JI, from Gen AI, take a past study, and it doesn't even have to be a recent past study. Supply the system with all the background that was available before the data collection, for example, the questionnaire, and then compare the results with the study results. If possible, compare it with the real world and compare the, as well as the individual statistics, compare the recommendations. 
on the system we saw from um, Andy and Signoy earlier, you could see that you could possibly just screen out here are the winners on that concept testing without even trusting that the ordering within the winning group was right. And I think that's a, a key part of thinking about this process. So my predictions, augmented data is going to grow. It will cause very little fuss and it will only have a marginal impact on cost and speed. With augmented data, you're still collecting surveys. You're still doing all that work. You're trying to make it a little bit better. So it's not going to have such a big impact on the industry. Um, there are people currently selling and buying synthetic data. This is going to grow. Synthetic data will be faster, cheaper, and I do not believe it will be as good as primary data. This was true to the move of online data collection. When we went from catty and face-to-face -to, -face to online, it was faster, cheaper, but not as good. I think that will be true here. And this isn't a prediction, this is a hope. I hope that we will create a standardized testing system and a requirement to share sufficient information with buyers for them to make an informed decision. But it's not a prediction, just a hope. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions.